they waited for this blizzard. They needed a blizzard, a real blizzard. Little did they know <laughs> they were going to get more than they bargained for. Here we go. Our house was near the studio. This is Lillian Gish speaking. And I was to report for work at any hour that snow started to fall. As we had both day and night scenes to film. It was a late but severe winter. Even Long Island Sound was frozen over. I slept with one eye open, waiting for the blizzard. Winter dragged on and was almost over, and still those important scenes hadn't been filmed. The blizzard finally struck in March. Drifts eight feet high <laughs> swallowed the studio. The trees on Orienta Point lashed the sky and groaned as the chains that held them together were stretched taut. Mr. Griffith, Billy, the staff, and the assistant directors stood with their backs to the gale, bundled up in coats, mufflers, hats, and gloves. To hold the cameras upright, three men lay on the ground gripping the tripod legs. <laughs> A small fire burned directly beneath the camera to keep the oil from freezing. Again and again, I struggled through the storm. Once I fainted, and it wasn't in the script. I was hauled to the studio on a sled, thawed out with hot tea, and then brought back to the blizzard, where the others were waiting. We filmed all day and all night, stopping only to eat, standing near a bonfire. We never went inside, even for a short warm-up. <laughs> The torture of returning the, to the cold wasn't worth the temporary warmth. The blizzard never slackened. At one point, the camera froze. There was an excruciating delay as the men huddled against the wind tried to get another fire started. <laughs> Man. At one time, my face was caked with a crust of ice and snow, and icicles, like little spikes, formed on my eyelashes, making it difficult to keep my eyes open. Above the howling storm, Mr. Griffiths shouted, Billy, move in! Get that face! Get that face! <laughs> Get that face! I will, Billy shouted. If the oil doesn't freeze in the camera. <laughs> we lost several members of our crew from pneumonia as the result of exposure. <laughs> Though he worked with his back to the wind whenever possible, Mr. Griffith's face froze. A trained nurse was at his side for the rest of the blizzard and the winter scenes. The scenes on and, and around the ice were filmed at White River Junction, Vermont, where the White River and the Connecticut flowed side by side. The ice was thick. It had to be either sawed or dynamited so that there would be flows for each day's filming. It wasn't melting. The temperature never rose above zero during the three weeks we worked there. <laughs> For the scene in which Anna faints on the ice flow, I thought of a piece of business and suggested it to Mr. Griffith, who agreed it was a fine idea. I always, I was always having bright ideas and suffering for them. <laughs> I suggested that my hand and hair trail in the water as I lay on the flow that was drifting toward the falls. Mr. Griffith was delighted with the effect. <laughs> After a while, my hair froze, and I felt as if my hand were in a flame. To this day, it aches if I am out in the cold for very long. When the sequence was finally finished, I had been on a slab of ice at least 20 times a day for three weeks. In between takes, one of the men would throw a coat around me, and I would warm myself briefly by a fire. This kind of dedication probably seems foolish today. 
but it wasn't unusual then. Those of us who worked with Mr. Griffith were completely committed to the picture we were making. <laughs> no sacrifice was too great to get the film right, to get it accurate, true, perfect. <laughs> we weren't important in our minds, only the picture. Mr. Griffith felt the same way. It was his picture, not he, that counted. Dick Bartholomus had only a short time before been a sophomore at nearby Dartmouth College. His schoolmates thought it would be exciting to watch a film being made before their eyes and came to visit. <clears throat> they didn't stay very long. The sub-zero weather drove them indoors. <laughs> <clears throat> the scene of Anna's rescue from the falls was all too realistically recreated. <laughs> Mr. Griffith was directing Dick from a bridge over the river. But the noise of the falls drowned out his directions. Dick, a slight young man, was hampered by the heavy raccoon coat and spiked boots he had to wear. <clears throat> As I headed toward the falls on my slab of ice, Mr. Griffith shouted to Dick that he was moving too slowly, but Dick couldn't hear him. The people on the banks were also yelling frantically. As Dick ran toward me, he began to get he became excited, leapt and landed on a piece of ice that was too small. He sank into the water, climbed back out, finally lifted me in his arms as I was about to go over and ran like mad to the shore. Years later, when Dick and I were reminiscing, he said, I wonder why we went through with it. We could have been killed. <laughs> I know it's not funny, but it is because it's either laugh or cry. <clears throat> there isn't enough money in the world to pay me to do that today, he said, quote, unquote. But we weren't doing it for money. The thing about the waterfall scene is that in the 70s, and then again in, well, uh, 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 Lillian Gish was interviewed, and she gave a completely different account of what happened. And then uh, in another part of the documentary made in 93, right, they, they, um, they put forth that the whole thing was done very safely. And uh, with that, the camera was had a a, a, a kerosene lighter lamp um, to to warm it, which they may have developed later, and uh, and that the um, rescue was was filmed in the summertime with wooden blocks for the ice cubes, ice flows, and I don't know, but when you watched. I'll have to watch the Blu-ray very carefully and see exactly what those things are. With all due respect to Mr. Brownlow and Mr. Gill, um, whether this is some sort of whitewashing of D.W. Griffith's moral standing in history or, or something, I, I guess that may be what they were doing. But the account given in this book by Lillian Gish herself speaking to another woman in 1969, there's, I can't think of any reason she would make that up. And it's a, it's, it's, a, it's a very disturbing, it's one of those things, one of those uh, urban legend type things that, that developed, of course it was a Hollywood legends or notoriously wrong and lies and this is one of them like, like the, we were talking earlier about the, the 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 house that was supposed to be the wrong house that Hal Roach destroyed in the Laurel and Hardy film it wasn't in reality at all it was you know, so there you go <laughs> <laughs>